Hello everybody, today we're going to talk about transcription. This is the second of two videos on transcription. In the first video we introduced the relevant topics you need to know about transcription for the USMLE Step 1. In this video we will put everything we learned in the first video and go over the individual steps of transcription and post transcriptional modifications that you need to know for the USMLE Step 1. Specifically, we will go over initiation, elongation, termination, RNA splicing, addition of a poly A tail, and 5' prime cap. And lastly, we will briefly describe the structure of mature mRNA. So with that said, let's start a discussion with transcription. As we mentioned in previous videos, transcription can be divided into three steps. Initiation, elongation, and termination. The first of these steps, initiation, begins with the binding of RNA polymerase and various transcription factors to DNA. Once the appropriate transcription factors are present, RNA polymerase is able to bind a promoter and start synthesizing RNA. Let's take a closer look at this process on the next slide. Here we have a simplified illustration of initiation of transcription. Transcription of most eukaryotic genes involves the interplay of various transcription factors and is an extremely complex process. This is a gross simplification of what really happens, but it shows the most important concepts of RNA transcription that you must be familiar with for the USMLE Step 1. First, a transcription factor such as an activator will bind to a regulatory sequence called an enhancer. There are many mechanisms by which a transcription factor can help RNA polymerase bind the promoter sequence. However, you do not need to know these. What you need to know is that transcription factors such as activators are essential for initiation of transcription. With the help of proper transcription factors, RNA polymerase can bind the promoter sequence. Once this occurs, RNA polymerase can start synthesizing the RNA strand. At this point, initiation is over and elongation has begun. So what you need to know regarding initiation is the importance of transcription factors and regulatory sequences in regulating transcription. You also need to be familiar with the characteristics of promoter sequences, such as TATA and CAT boxes. Lastly, you must be familiar with the positioning of regulatory sequences, promoter sequences, and genes in DNA. So what I mean by this is that a gene typically has three important elements. It will have regulatory sequences, it will have a promoter sequence, and finally, it will have the coding section, or the gene. It's important to know that there can be various regulatory sequences, and they can be in many different locations in the genome. So for example, you can have a regulatory sequence before the promoter, such as in my drawing. You can also have a regulatory sequence in between the promoter and the gene, or you can have a regulatory sequence after the gene and after the promoter. It doesn't matter. You can even have multiple regulatory sequences one after the other. Unlike regulatory sequences, the promoter is always located before the gene. So for example, if we can imagine that this RNA polymerase molecule is going to read DNA in this orientation, then the gene must be on the path that RNA polymerase will take. That is, the gene must be downstream to the promoter. One more thing that I want you to remember is the types of RNA polymerase. In this image, we are using RNA polymerase type 2. Therefore, this is a eukaryotic cell such as a human cell. In bacteria, remember that there's only one RNA polymerase that does everything. However, eukaryotes have three types of RNA polymerase, labeled RNA polymerase 1 through 3. I also want to take this opportunity to remind you to never confuse DNA polymerases with RNA polymerases. So if you recall from a lecture in DNA replication, prokaryotes have three types of DNA polymerase that are also labeled DNA polymerase 1 through 3. Do not confuse prokaryotic DNA polymerases with eukaryotic RNA polymerases. Prokaryotes have three types of DNA polymerase and only one type of RNA polymerase. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, have over 20 different types of DNA polymerases and three types of RNA polymerases. You are not expected to know the eukaryotic DNA polymerases. You're only expected to know the eukaryotic RNA polymerases and the prokaryotic DNA polymerases as well as RNA polymerase. So with that said, let's move on to elongation. Elongation is characterized by the elongation of the new RNA strand by RNA polymerase. Just like DNA replication, transcription occurs in the 5 to 3' prime direction. That is, RNA polymerase adds nucleotides to the 3 end of the RNA strand. As a result, the 5' prime end is made first. Remember, the strands in double-stranded DNA are anti-parallel, and so is the strand of RNA relative to the DNA strand being read. Therefore, DNA is read in the 3 to 5 prime direction and RNA is made in the 5 to 3 prime direction. Remember, this is because they are anti-parallel. So for example, let's say that you have a strand of DNA that is being read by RNA polymerase. Let's say that this is the 3 prime end and this is the 5 prime end. 
and our RNA polymerase is right here. Since RNA polymerase reads DNA in the 3 to 5 prime direction, this RNA polymerase will move in this direction. The RNA strand that is made, however, will be anti-parallel, that is, the 5 prime end will be made first, and eventually, once the RNA polymerase is done reading the DNA, you will have a 3 prime end. And this makes perfect sense, since remember, RNA polymerase is synthesized in the 5 to 3 prime direction. The next concept that I want you to know is that the RNA strand that is made is complementary to the DNA strand that is being read. The only difference is that the RNA strand contains uracil in the place of thymine. Let's take a closer look at this process in the next slide. Here we have a simplified illustration of the elongation step of transcription. So as we said before, RNA polymerase makes the RNA strand from the 5 to 3 prime direction. So we can imagine that this is the 5 prime end of the RNA transcript. Initially, the new RNA strand binds to the complementary DNA strand. However, as the RNA strand becomes longer, it dissociates from the DNA strand in order to form a single-stranded molecule of RNA. RNA polymerase will continue to read DNA and elongate the RNA strand until it reaches a termination sequence. Once this occurs, elongation is complete and termination begins. What you need to know regarding elongation is that RNA is synthesized from the 5 to 3 prime direction and that the RNA molecule that is made is complementary to the DNA strand that is being read. The major difference being that RNA does not contain thymine and instead it uses uracil. Also, remember, if we're talking about eukaryotic transcription, the RNA strand is made by an RNA polymerase called RNA polymerase type 2. Now let's move on and talk about termination. The mechanisms of termination of transcription are extremely complex and various mechanisms have been described in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Fortunately, you're not expected to know the details of any one mechanism or be familiar with all the different mechanisms that have been described. For that reason, we're not going to dive too deep into the mechanisms of termination, but I'm going to give you a brief overview of the most common mechanisms. So let's start with prokaryotes. Prokaryotes utilize two mechanisms of termination which are named based on whether or not they utilize an enzyme called Rho. Rho is an enzyme which recognizes specialized RNA sequences and cleave the mRNA in order to stop transcription. On the other hand, Rho-independent mechanisms do not use this enzyme. These mechanisms require the formation of a hairpin structure that causes RNA polymerase to dissociate from the DNA and terminate transcription. As I said before, you do not need to be familiar with the details of prokaryotic termination. Just know that two mechanisms exist, one which involves the enzyme called Rho and another which requires the formation of an RNA hairpin loop. Eukaryotic termination mechanisms are even more complex than prokaryotic termination mechanisms. Generally, there are two mechanisms of transcription termination in eukaryotes. One involves specialized sequences called termination sequences that tell RNA polymerase to cease transcription, and one which does not involve termination sequences. Normally, transcription of genes which code for proteins, that is, genes that do not code for non-coding RNAs, typically do not utilize termination sequences, and instead, transcription occurs indefinitely until the end of the genome, long after the target gene has been transcribed. Since there are no termination sequences, the mRNA which contains the target gene must be separated from the rest of the mRNA. This is accomplished by special proteins called CPSF which identify sequences on the growing mRNA strand and cleave the mRNA once the target gene has been transcribed. The mRNA that is made after cleavage by CPSF is not used and is destroyed. So for example, let's say that we have a DNA strand that is being read by RNA polymerase. Let's say that this is the RNA strand. If we assume that the target gene is right here, well then CPSF enzymes will come and cleave the RNA right here. This part will be used for post-transcription modifications and will be used for translation and protein production. The rest of the mRNA which is made after CPSF cleavage is not used and is destroyed. This RNA polymerase will eventually keep going and going to the end of the genome or occasionally some enzymes will stop the RNA polymerase. However, what you need to know is that there are no specific termination sequences. So what you need to know regarding termination is that two mechanisms of termination exist in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, there is a row-dependent mechanism and a row-independent mechanism. In eukaryotes, there, are, there is a mechanism which requires the use of termination sequences and one which does not require the use of termination sequences. So now let's switch gears and talk about post-transcription modifications. There are three types of post-transcription modifications that you must be familiar with. RNA splicing, addition of the poly A tail, and addition of the 5' prime cap. Let's start with splicing. RNA splicing, or the removal of RNA introns, requires the help of a large protein and RNA structure called the spliceosome. 
The spliceosome is composed of both proteins and non-coding RNAs called SNRNAs, or short nuclear RNAs. In order for the spliceosome to identify and know where to cleave introns, special DNA sequences inside introns are recognized. These sequences are called the donor site, the branch site, and the acceptor site. Let's take a closer look at this process on the next slide. Here we have an illustration of the RNA splicing process. Generally, all introns start with the sequence UG and end with the sequence AG, that is if you consider the 5' prime end as the start of the mRNA molecule. The UG sequence is called the donor site, and the AG sequence is called the acceptor site. Somewhere in the intron, there's another sequence which contains an adenine nucleotide. This sequence is called the branch site. The sequences have these names because of the biochemical reactions required to remove the intron. You do not need to know the reactions and steps required for intron removal. However, you do need to know that introns have a donor site, a branch site, and an acceptor site. Mutations of any of these sequences can lead to problems with splicing, and this can lead to disease. So let's say for example that you have a mutation that knocks out this U. Well then all of a sudden we will lose the donor site and splicing of this intron will not happen. This is what happens in some kinds of beta thalassemia. In beta thalassemia, you have an error in splicing of mRNA. Another concept that you need to be familiar with is that there are specialized SNRNAs called SNRMPs or SNRPs that identify these sequences and remove the intron by cleaving the mRNA and reanneating the adjacent exons. SNRMPs are a crucial component of the spliceosome. In this image we can see that we have two kinds of SNRMPs which are identifying different sequences in the intron. This is a simplification. There are many different SNRMPs and proteins in the spliceosome. But what I want you to know is that SNRMPs are a kind of SNRNA which is responsible for splicing. Once the intron is removed, it is converted into a ring-like structure called a lariat. As you can see, the UG and AG sequence act as the borders of the intron. The lariat is removed and degraded by enzymes. It is not used in translation. Next, let's talk about the addition of the poly-A tail or polyadenylation. This is an extremely important step as lack of a poly-A tail will result in mRNA that is degraded before translation can occur. The poly-A tail is a simple, long sequence of repeating adenosine nucleotides located in the 3' end of the mRNA molecule. The poly-A tail is not coded in the DNA strand, but rather added by special proteins after termination has occurred. Here we can see an illustration of the poly-A tail. Essentially, it is a long sequence of repeating adenosine nucleotides which are placed at the 3' end of the mRNA molecule after termination has occurred. When the mRNA leaves the nucleus, the 3' end is progressively shortened. Once the poly-A tail has been completely removed, the mRNA will be destroyed. Special non-coding RNAs called microRNAs can destroy mRNA by speeding up the process of poly-A tail degradation. Now let's move on to the 5' cap. Like the poly-A tail, the 5' cap functions to protect mRNA from degradation. However, it is also important for initiating translation after the mRNA has left the nucleus. The addition of the 5' cap occurs while the mRNA is still being transcribed. It consists of a modified guanine base called 7-methylguanosine linked to the mRNA molecule via a triphosphate bridge. Let's take a closer look at the 5' cap on the next slide. Here we can see a close-up of the 5' cap. Essentially, the 5' cap is a modified nucleotide that is connected to the RNA molecule via three repeating phosphate atoms called a triphosphate bridge. We can see the triphosphate bridge right here. In this image, the red structure represents the phosphate groups, the blue structure represents the ribose sugar, and the green structures represent the nucleic bases. Here you can see the 7-methylguanosine. It is called 7-methylguanosine because it contains an additional methyl group. Otherwise, it is the same kind of guanosine present throughout nucleic acids. So in summary, the 5' cap has two major functions that is, to protect the mRNA from degradation and to help initiate translation. Now that we have discussed all the major steps involved in transcription and post-transcriptional modifications, let's talk about the structure of mature mRNA. Mature mRNA contains four basic elements. They are the 5' cap, the poly-A tail, 
the coding sequence and two sections adjacent to the coding sequence which are not translated during protein translation. These are known as the 5' prime and 3' prime untranslated regions. Here we have a representation of mature mRNA. You can see all the four major elements of mature mRNA. It is important to know that typically only a portion of the mRNA molecule is, trans is translated into protein. This is known as the coding sequence. The coding sequence is distinguished from the rest of the mRNA molecule by start and stop codons, which are identified by the ribosome during translation and signal when to start and stop translation. So for example, we can imagine that somewhere around here there is a start codon, and somewhere in this area there is a stop codon, which are identified by the ribosome. The rest of this stuff is not used during translation. It is simply ignored by the ribosome. We will talk more about this on our lecture on translation. So in summary, initiation involves the binding of RNA polymerases and several transcription factors to DNA. Elongation involves the synthesis of RNA by RNA polymerase. Termination involves the seizing of RNA synthesis. RNA splicing involves the use of special intron sequences called acceptor site, branch site, and donor sites. And the addition of the poly A tail and 5' prime cap are essential for mRNA survival and function. That is it for transcription. Thank you for watching. See you on the next lecture.